Now, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Harper, who will give the commencement address. Dr. Harper. I have some props. Good afternoon. I've been asked to share some thoughts with you today, and the best way to do it is with a simple glass of water. So bear with me. I also have cough, so this will come in handy in a few minutes. The question is often posed, is the glass half empty or is it half full? The optimist sees it as half full, meaning there's more to be added to it. The pessimist looks at what's missing. Distinction is fundamental to your journey after graduation. This afternoon, I want to talk about numbers, food, animals, forest, people, and ideas. But I'll do that in 10 minutes. Let's start about a couple, talk about a couple numbers. The first is 100,000. Most of you being business majors probably thought, well, 100,000 is my starting salary in dollars. But we're not talking about dollars today. We're going to talk about hours. Because most of you will spend at least 100,000 hours at work before you retire. It could be more. Hopefully, for some of you, it will be less. Wouldn't it be nice if you could look forward to the 2,500 Monday mornings as much as you look forward to the 2,500 Friday afternoons? Here come the food and the animals. This continuation of the half full versus half empty situation, except it applies to how you approach your work and how you approach your life. The tradition is clear, as clear as a traditional breakfast. When it comes to the bacon, excuse me, when it comes to the eggs, the chicken participated in the meal. When it comes to the bacon, however, the pig was totally committed. Hopefully you'll find a job and have a career where you are committed rather than just one where you go through the motions. Early in my career when I was on the faculty at Arizona State University, I ran into one of my mentors and he had asked me how my last class went. I responded, well, frankly, it's a little bit it was a little bit boring. And as all good mentors do, he looked at me and simply said this, Steve, if it's, you're bored, it's your fault. My job obviously now is to make topics more interesting and relevant. Henry David Thoreau noted, most men are destined to live lives of quiet desperation. Hopefully you, and of course, we don't want to be gender biased females as well. In your journey, take a moment periodically to make sure you are in the right job. If you're bored, then change your job or change jobs. Now let's talk about the forest. There's a story about two managers, each overseeing a work group, that were cutting their way through the forest. The first manager is focusing on the speed at which the crew is cutting through the forest on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. The second manager, however, pauses to ask, what are we doing here? She climbs the nearest tree, looks around, and yells, wrong forest. In your journey, take a moment periodically to make sure you're in the right company and the right industry. Well, let's talk about the first of many people. I'll start with Wayne Gretzky, and I know a bunch of my students have heard a lot about Wayne Gretzky even though I wasn't a hockey player. But he was considered one of the greatest hockey players of all time. And a sportscaster asked him one day, what do you attribute your success? And his answer was, as many of you have heard before, most people play the puck where it is on the ice. I sense where it's going to be, skate there, and you usually have a one-on-one -on -one shot with a goalie, and that attributes to his success. In your journey, take a moment periodically to make sure you are positioned to sense and, eat and seize opportunities, as Gretzky did. Now let's take a look at something that happened in my journey. A few years ago, Diane Levy, who was head of the honors program, called me and invited me to teach a one-hour personal reflections class. I went through a whole litany of things that I was doing, the stuff I had in my plate, and said, said to Diane, this just isn't a good time. And Diane looked at me and said, Steve, there will never be a good time, so let's just put you on the program now. And I think that that was good because she forced me back up the tree to make sure that I was in the right forest. I love my work in Cameron, but getting into the honors program obviously had, gave me the opportunity to interact with a lot of students. Her challenge in this case was very simple. He said, she said, you can teach it whenever you want, you can approach it however you want, and I'll give you 20 of our best and brightest students at UNCW. How could you turn down that offer? Well, I learned a lot in that course as it progressed over time. But one of the most important things I learned came from a comment made by one of my students. When I ask students what they want from their lives, almost all of them say, to, succeed, to be successful. For many of them, it applies to their careers. For other people, it applies to other dimensions. 
Yet that one student said she wanted to be significant. Her comment got, me, got my attention and caused me to pause and reflect. It was like a wrong forest realization. The path to significance is quite different from the path to success. The path to success tends to be rather selfish. The path to significance tends to be rather selfless. Ironically, I had read a story by Lauren Isley called The Star Thrower early in that semester. Her story reinforced that student's comment. According to the story, a young girl was walking along the beach upon which thousands of starfish had been washed up during a terrible storm. When she came up to each starfish, she would pick it up and throw it into the ocean. People watched her with amusement. She had been doing this for some time when a man approached her and said, little girl, why are you doing this? Look at the beach. You can't save all these starfish. You can't begin to make a difference. The girl seemed crushed. But after a few moments, she bent down, picked up another starfish, and hurled it as far as she could into the ocean. Then she looked up at the man and replied, I made a difference to that one. The old man looked at the girl and thought about what she had done and said, inspired, he joined the little girl in throwing starfish back into the sea. Soon others joined in, and all the starfish were saved. In your journey, take a moment periodically to make sure your desire to be successful does not keep you from being significant, too. Let's take a look at a couple, of, a couple of ideas. The honors course prompted me to take a closer look at the role our attitudes play in our lives. I found that two words in particular affect how we deal with our lives. The first is someday, and the second is problem. I encourage my students to drop both words from their vocabulary. Too many people put things off that they want to do as well as things they dread to someday. Someday doesn't exist. It isn't the eighth day of the week. It isn't the 13th month of the year. So why do we keep on scheduling something for someday? It does not exist. I encourage my students to drop the word someday and replace it with buyer before a certain date that they will have completed whatever they're talking about there. Some of the things postponed someday involve one's dreams. They're like a bucket list, the things that you want to do before you kick the bucket. Yet by putting them off to someday, many are not fulfilled. Thomas Edison noted, Dreams without execution are mere hallucinations. Instead of having a bucket list, create a while I'm in my 20s list. And when you do that for each decade, you probably won't need a bucket list. You'll have already accomplished those things. When Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com, was asked how he approached his life, he said, I want to live my life with the least amount of regrets. By identifying what's truly important and not scheduling those things for someday, you reduce your regrets. You also reduce your guilt for the things that you could have done and should have done. The point about seizing the moment and future was emphasized by two other well-known people. The first was Steve Jobs. When his people got caught up in endless discussions, he would simply yell at them and say, you've got to drive the stake in the ground. Too much conversation, too little action. The other well-known person, some of you may be aware of him, is Jean-Luc Picard. Yes, Jean-Luc Picard, commander of the Starship Enterprise. He noted that nothing happens until you engage the warp drive. In your journey, remember Jeff Bezos' words, coming up with ideas is easy. Making them reality is the tough part. One of my favorite guidelines is known as the NOAA rule. It goes like this. No more prizes for predicting rain, prizes only for building arcs. Let's take a look at the word problem. How you frame a situation is how you approach it. The word problem has a negative, almost defeatist connotation. Think about what it's like to sit down in a meeting where the manager comes in with a list of problems. Who wants to be there? How different the meeting would be if the manager comes in and starts with a list of situations, situations that need to be addressed. The word situation is more engaging. Even the White House gets it. They don't meet in the problem room. They meet in the situation room. Yet I think we can do better than that. I encourage people to use the word challenge. Most people like challenges. They like rising to the occasion because challenges bring out the best in people. Here again, is the glass half empty or is it half full? Some people see the world as full of, pro as full of problems, yet entrepreneurs see the world as full of opportunities. Peter Drucker noted, within every problem lies at least one disguised business opportunity. It's the same world. The only difference is how you approach it. In your journey, remember Wayne Gretzky's approach. While a little for with a little foresight, you can sense and seize opportunities by creating innovative products outstanding companies, and possibly industries. I would be remiss if I left Alan Kay out of the equation. 
He played a critical role in the early stages of uh, Apple's success. He noted the best way to predict the future is to invent it. While I'm talking about technology and innovation, it might be worthwhile to take a little trip back in time. When I was an undergraduate like you, Thomas Watson Jr. was CEO of IBM, and IBM had the motto, think, so that people would spend time thinking rather than just doing. A few years later, Steve Jobs came along with his slogan, think different. And yet, I think Steve Jobs left something out. Thinking different isn't enough. Doing different is what makes things happen. And yet, maybe he did. His famous Think Different ad, ad closed with, while some people see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. This is one of my favorite quotes. Winston Churchill captured the need to sense and seize opportunities when he said, to each there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped, figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing, unique to them and fitted to their talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds them unprepared or unqualified for what could have been their finest hour. Gene Kranz captured the same situation when he was the head of mission control for the Apollo 13 flight. When the Apollo 13 crew was on the verge of being stranded in space, one of his directors said, this might be the darkest hour in the history of NASA. I like Kranz's comment. He said, with all due respect, I think this could be our finest hour. Machiavelli, excuse me, Ken, uh, Jack Kennedy noted in his inaugural address, the torch has been passed to a new generation. Today, the diploma is being passed to a new generation, your generation. Machiavelli noted your challenge in the Prince when he stated, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertainty in, in the success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Well, here are two of Harper's laws. Number one, just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. And just because you haven't done it doesn't mean you can't do it. You have choices in your journey. You can be a path taker or you can be a path maker. You can be the casualty of change or you can be the initiator and beneficiary of change. It's time for me to wrap up today's class. So I want to give you three assignments. The first assignment is to take the rubber band that was sitting on top of your program for today I know my MBAs are chuckling. Oh, not one more time. It's there for a purpose. This is not a rubber band anymore. This is your carpet diem band. I'd like you to put it on your wrist, and yes, I provide some for the faculty too. I did not have enough gall to do it for the platform party though. I'm sure there's something as you came in today that you've been postponing. It may be something very small, it could be very big. It could be something that you want to do, it could be something that you dread doing, but you know that there's something you have to do. I want you to make a commitment to yourself that you will take care of that this weekend. Put the rubber band on your wrist as a reminder. This is now the carpe diem band. Don't take it off until you've seized the moment. It could be as simple as writing a thank you note. Not texting, but actually taking out a pen and doing it the long way, the genuine way. No more texting for something like this. I'm sure that there is some coach, some teacher, somebody in your life, member of the family who helped you get here today. Take a moment, it only takes about 10 minutes to do something that has far more value than a text message today. So see what you can do with that. The second assignment is to watch Randy Pouch's last lecture on YouTube. It will change your life. The third assignment is to watch Steve Jobs' commencement address at Stanford in 2005 on YouTube. It too will change your life. Steve Jobs was known for having his one more thing before wrapping up his presentations. Well, here's my one more thing. In your journey, you are destined to encounter cynics, skeptics, pessimists who say, oh, I'll believe that when pigs fly. My response to them is, there's a flying pig. When you run into, your, into skeptics, your job is to show them the glass is half full. The moral to today's class is simple. Don't be a chicken, be a seahawk. Or if you seize the day and seize the future, you will in fact soar as a Seahawk. I wish you the best in your journey.